Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. O Father, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. This week, I took my neighbor to an auto body shop to get an estimate for the repair of her car, and we were sitting in the waiting room. It was quite a small waiting room. There were others sitting there, and she asked me, so when was the first time you knew you wanted to be a minister of the gospel? And so I kind of told her my story, and I knew all these other people were listening because we were sitting so close together. But I know the exact moment when I decided, and it was when I was a sophomore in college, and I was feeling at that point that my mother had expectations on me to go into the ministry. Uh, But this was a false assumption. She had no expectations in that direction. And so my mother is driving me back to college on a Monday morning. I had gone home for the weekend. And I said to my mother, Mom, I really don't think I want to go into the ministry. And she said, that's all right, honey. I just want you to do whatever you want that will make you happy. And I felt like this tremendous burden just lifted off of me, even though she had no expectations. And it was from that point on that I decided to go into the gospel ministry. And I never wavered from pursuing uh, that goal. And so I graduated from Geneva College in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania with a Bachelor of Arts in History in in, uh, May of 1985. And then Marlene and I were married that summer. And then I went right into seminary for three years at the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary. This was in Wilkinsburg, which was a suburb of Pittsburgh. And I graduated from there in May of 1988. And then in October of 1988... I uh, took my first call at a Presbyterian church in Maryland, Timonium Presbyterian Church. I was on staff there. And after I was on staff there for about a year, I was ordained. And then in January of 1991, I came here uh, to pastor as a solo pastor here at Calvary. And uh, I was only 28 years when I showed up uh, here, and I remember being so overwhelmed so unqualified, so out of my leg. I'm thinking, what am I doing? And as I think about starting the ministry here in that January of 1991, we read in this passage before us that Jesus is about to begin his public ministry. And Jesus, at this point, is now 30 years old. We know that from Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And the last thing we've read in Matthew's gospel about Jesus is when he was two years old and the Magi come and visit him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and then he's whisked away to Egypt. But from the age of two to the age of 30, we have no idea what's going on in the life of Jesus, except for one instance. But I I often wonder... What was Jesus doing during all that time? How was his interactions with his family and friends and and neighbors? And and how was he occupying his time? But now we come to the baptism of Jesus, and we know that it is a very significant event. 
as we find all three members of the Trinity present and involved in this occasion. And remember what we said about the Gospel of Matthew, that the Gospel of Matthew portrays Jesus as a king. So let me give you some context here. We've noticed in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, we see the arrival of the king as he is born in Bethlehem to Joseph and Mary. And then in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we have the adoration of the king as the magi come and visit him. And they bow down to him and they worship him, giving him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, we have the announcement of the king as John the Baptist announces the arrival of Jesus to begin his public ministry. And then here in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, we have the commissioning of the king. And so here in this passage, Jesus steps out of obscurity and he makes his first public appearance. And it's the inauguration of his public ministry. And here we learn what is needed in order to be equipped for ministry in Christ's name. And what we should understand is that every believer is called to be a minister in Jesus' name. Ministry is not given exclusively to professional clergy. Listen to these verses in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he, that is the Father, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for works of ministry for building up the body of Christ. So why did he give shepherds or pastors to the church? To equip the saints, all of us, to do the work of ministry. Next time someone comes up to you and asks, who are the ministers at Calvary Presbyterian Church? You say, all of us. Paul and I, we simply equip you so that you can do the work of ministry. And sometimes we fall into the thinking that we pay the pastor to do the work of ministry because that's his job. But it's really the calling of all of us to be ministers. And so since you are called to minister in Christ's name, then what do you need in order to be an effective minister of the gospel? This passage mentions three essential qualities. First, we must learn to identify with sinners. Second, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And third, we must be assured of the Father's approval. So first, let us consider that we must identify with sinners. As Jesus makes his first public appearance in a very long time, he is coming to the Jordan, he is coming to John for a very specific purpose. Notice verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. So Jesus is coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. Now this creates a major dilemma for John the Baptist because John's baptism is for the repentance of sins. Notice what we read in Matthew chapter 3 verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance. And so the difficulty in John's mind is that he knew Jesus as the promised Messiah, the divine Son of God, and as such he is sinless. He is innocent. He is pure in righteousness. So why should Jesus be baptized with the baptism for sinners when Jesus had no sin in his life? Think about Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize 
with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now notice John's protest in verse 14. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And that phrase, John would have prevented him, is found in the Greek imperfect tense, meaning that it is a continuing action. So the meaning here is that John kept hindering him. John was doing everything he could to prevent Jesus from being baptized. John was earnestly, strongly, and intensely trying to hinder Jesus from being baptized. But the reason Jesus insisted on being baptized was because he wanted to identify with sinners whom he came to save. Jesus is associating with sinners in his baptism. He is stepping into the shoes of sinners. Jesus' entire life was one of being near sinners and ministering to them. In Isaiah 53 verse 12, it speaks prophetically of Christ and it says, He was numbered with the transgressors. We see Jesus, he goes to Matthew's home and he's dining with tax collectors and sinners. He's allowing the lepers and the prostitutes to touch him. He comes near to the demon possessed and casts the demons out. He is always associating with the unclean, the sick, the outcasts, the sinners, and the down and outers of society. Even in his death, he was crucified between two thieves. But Jesus did more than associate and identify with sinners. He did more than simply befriend them and pal around with them. He does not merely come alongside us. The Bible says that Jesus became sin for our sakes. We read this in our assurance of pardon, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We could make the argument that the most sinful and vile and wretched man who ever walked this earth was Christ because when he died on that cross, he bore the sin of all his people in his body on that tree. He became sin that we might be made righteous. And so what does this have to do in our ministry to others? It means that in the words of Francis Schaeffer, we are to minister to others as sinner to sinner. Not looking down on people and judging them as if we are superior to them. It means taking the log out of our own eye before we look at the speck in our brother or our sister's eye. I think of the Rembrandt painting of the prodigal son where the prodigal is returned home to his father in humbleness and repentance. And the prodigal is, is kneeling before his father, and you can see his back, and it, the clothes are torn, and he has bloody marks on his body, and his sandals are torn off. And he's leaning in towards his father, and his father's standing over him, holding him close to his chest, and embracing him so tenderly and so compassionately. And then if you look at the painting, off to the right is the older brother, and he's standing on a step higher, on a higher platform than the father and the son, and he's standing erect, and he's beautifully clothed, and he's looking down with the scowl on his face and these furrowed brows, and he's looking at them with disdain and disgust, just judging them, just judging them. And I wonder how many times 
I have stood in the same place as that older brother, just judging others. And I wonder how many older brothers are in the church today, just judging, looking down at others. Do you think that a person will open up to you if they sense that you are going to judge them and condemn them? We need to work on our approachability. Do people feel comfortable in coming to you with their problems and their struggles and their inadequacies? And if not, we need to ask the question, why is that the case? I would suggest that a good approach is when we sit down with someone else, first share with them our inadequacies and our sin issues and our difficulties. And they'll be ready to share with you. And if you can't come up with those sin issues, then you have a bigger problem, which is blindness to your own sin because of self-righteous pride. And I think what I'm trying to say is, cheer up because you're a lot worse than you think. And I need to cheer up because I'm a lot worse than I think. And think about this, that if our sinless Savior has descended to such depths in humility to identify with sinners, then shouldn't it be easier for us who already possess a sin nature to relate to sinners like ourselves. Not only must we learn to identify with sinners, but secondly, if we are going to minister to others, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Now, I've read many explanations as to why the Spirit descended upon Jesus as a dove. Some point to creation where the Spirit was hovering over the waters at creation. Some point to Noah as he sent the dove out from the ark. Some say it's because of his gentleness and the way he approaches Jesus. But I really think John MacArthur gets it right. And he said, think about what a first century Jewish person would have thought when he saw the word dove. And remember that Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. And any Jewish audience reading this would have thought of the word sacrifice. Because it was the most common sacrifice that was offered in the temple. Because if a wealthy man came to the temple and offered an offering, they would bring a bull. If you're an upper middle class person, you would come and you would offer a lamb. But if you were a commoner, if you were someone who was poor, you would come and you would offer doves as your sacrifice. And that was more than the majority of the population in Israel. And so as the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus like a dove, what the Holy Spirit is telling us is that Jesus came to die for all his people, not just those who are super spiritual, not just those who are wealthy and important in society. He came for all of us. And then there's another question we must consider which is, why did the Spirit descend upon Jesus? Now, the Spirit is certainly anointing Jesus for ministry. In the Old Testament, those offices that were anointed were the prophet, the priest, and the king, and Jesus perfectly fulfills all those offices. And so Jesus is being anointed by the Holy Spirit for those offices. But you see, also the Holy Spirit comes to empower Christ for ministry. Now, another question comes to mind is, why would Jesus need the power and assistance of the Holy Spirit since he already is God the Son? Now, when you read through the Gospels, you can't help but notice how intertwined and involved 
the Holy Spirit is in the life and ministry of Christ. They are working hand in hand. And we often assume that Jesus operated on earth through his divine nature when performing his miracles. Now, there's not much written on the work and influence of the Holy Spirit in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. But thankfully, we have Puritan John Owen who addressed this matter in depth. And Owen had to make sure that the integrity of Christ's two natures, the divine and the human, were preserved. And so Owen said that the only way to preserve Christ's true humanness was to understand that the Holy Spirit was the actual and immediate author of all Christ's graces and miracles. Owen made sure that we understood that Christ's humanity is not gobbled up or devoured by his divine nature. And so the Holy Spirit always has a prominent role in Jesus' earthly life and ministry. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Listen to Sinclair Ferguson. This means that we cannot effectively minister without the Holy Spirit's presence and power in our lives. The Spirit who was present and active at Christ's conception as the head of the new creation, by whom he was anointed at baptism, who directed him throughout his temptations, empowered him in his miracles, energized him in his sacrifice, and vindicated him in his resurrection, now indwells disciples in this specific identity. You see what Ferguson is saying? Just as the Holy Spirit was empowering Christ in his ministry, so he indwells us and empowers us in our ministry. In John Stott's book, Basic Christianity, he cites William Temple, who said that it is no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it. I can't. And it is no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that. Jesus could do it. I can't. But if the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me, then I could write plays like that. And if the spirit of Jesus could come and live in me, then I could live like that. Stott comments, this is the secret of Christian sanctity. It is not that we should strive to live like Jesus, but that he, by his spirit, should come and live in us. You see, it's not enough for Jesus to be our example. We need him to be our savior. Let us live by faith in the mighty God who indwells all his children. And may we in turn live lives that are pure and honoring to God. And then the third thing we need if we are going to effectively minister to others is that we must be assured of the Father's approval. Verse 17. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. The Father was well pleased with Jesus at the outset of his ministry, and it is vital that in our service to Christ and his church that we be assured that our standing with God is in a good place. Because if we think that God is displeased with us, if we think that he is upset with us, or that he is distant and uncaring, then our service will be corrupted and it will be spoiled. We will serve out of guilt and not love or appreciation. Or we will serve out of despair. 
or we will serve attempting to earn our way and make up for the sins that we have incurred. And the only way to serve in ministry in a way that will glorify God and truly love people is to know that we are right with God and that God is pleased with us. How can we serve in ministry with a clean and clear conscience? Verse 15 says that Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. And so that means that when Jesus came, he lived out his life on earth to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law in obedience to the Father's will. God's standard is perfection. We are to be holy as our God is holy. And so Jesus came born of a woman. He was born under the law in order to redeem those who are under the law, which is us. He lived a life of perfect obedience while dwelling on earth in human flesh. In John's gospel account, we read of John the Baptist seeing Jesus approaching. And John the Baptist points out to his disciples and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John the Baptist is putting in people's mind the lambs that were brought to sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. And those lambs that were brought in the Old Testament had to be lambs that were without defect, without spot, without blemish. They had to be the best of the flock. No other sacrifice was acceptable to the Father. And so as we think of Jesus going to the cross and being our sacrifice. He had to be a sacrifice without blemish. And so he died on that cross, bearing our sin, and he was pleasing and acceptable to the Father because he lived in perfect obedience for us. And not only did he take away our sin and pay for it, but he transferred his righteousness to our account. And so when the Father looks at us, he's delighted and pleased with us. Because he sees what Jesus has done for us. The basis of our relationship with the Father is not based upon what we've done or not done. It's based on what Christ has done for us. And the magician's nephew, C.S. Lewis, writes of the creation of Narnia through the song of Aslan. And Aslan is the lion that represents Jesus in the book. And the creation song is clearly intended to reveal the majesty and the glory of Aslan. But there was this one Uncle Andrew who had great distaste and dissatisfaction for the song of Aslan. And he made himself believe that every time he heard this song, Aslan wasn't really singing, but he was roaring instead. Uncle Andrew thought, of course it can't really have been singing. I must have imagined it. I've been letting my nerves get out of order. Who ever heard of a lion singing? Let me ask you this. Can you hear the music of the gospel? Can you hear your heavenly Father singing over you with joy and delight? Do you know what Jesus has done for you in his life and in his sacrifice? The Father says concerning you, this is my beloved Son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Let us serve in the name and for the glory of our God and King. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
thank you for redeeming us and equipping us for ministry service in your name. Remind us of how dependent we must be upon you in our service in your name. O oh Lord, teach us to be humble that we might relate to others as sinner to sinner. Teach us to be dependent upon you in asking of your spirit to fill us. And please remind us that on the basis of your son's redeeming work that we, that you are well pleased with us. May you be glorified as we minister in your name and may your light of truth, salvation, and glory shine through our lives for your sake. In Jesus, the Lamb slain for us, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.